Bible topic of today is the bringing of Mars. It says, again, in human history, Mars has been a blurry dream, the stuff of legends, gods, and mystery. The planet, most like ours, has been thought impossible to reach, let alone to explore and inhabit. Robert Zubrin explains how we can one day terraform Mars, a process that can alter the atmosphere of the planet and take it away from a sustainable climate. Robert Zubrin is formerly a staff engineer at Lockheed Martin Astronauts in Denver. He is now president of his own company, Pioneer Astronautics. He holds master's degrees in aeronautics and astronautics and a doctorate in nuclear engineering. He is the inventor of several unique concepts of space propulsion and exploration. The author of over 100 published technical and non-technical papers in the field, such as, as well as a book on the case for Mars, The Planning to the Settle and Red Planet, and Why We Must, published by the Free Press. He is a fellow of the British Interplanetary Society and a member of the Executive Committee of the National Space Society. Prior to his work in astronautics, Dr. Zuber was employed in areas of thermonuclear fusion research, nuclear engineering, radiation protection, and as a high school science teacher. And it's my honor and privilege to introduce to you Dr. Robert Zuber. something is probably possible that a lot of people think is not possible, which is to say the uh, terraforming of Mars. Um, is this... Um, oh, right. See, that, even that is possible. <laughs> uh, first, I'm just going to make a few comments about colonization of Mars. Okay. Because my interest in Mars is because uh, I see it as a planet that we can colonize. I see it as a new world. I see Mars because it has the resources in a way that no other planet except for the Earth does in our solar system. For the next great age of exploration, Mars is like North America. The moon is like Greenland closer to Europe, but barren. Mars, a bit further away, like North America, but fertile, a place where a true branch of human civilization could be established. Now, talk about colonizing Mars. Uh, the difficulty of colonizing Mars is not fundamentally a problem of space transportation. Okay. In other words, it's not really the fact that so far away that makes that poses the fundamental problems associated with colonizing Mars. Uh, and I'll illustrate what I mean by that. Or so let's simply look at the transportation problem associated with colonizing Mars. The United States could, within five or perhaps ten years, uh, field a vehicle, a launch vehicle of this character, which is similar to the Aries that I showed you in the uh, talks at lunch except that you go up, uh, this hydrogen oxygen number stage, this one has a third stage, which is a nuclear thermal rocket engine. Uh, and a vehicle like this could throw 80 tons on direct trans-Mars injection. And that 80 tons could include, within the aeroshell, a habitat with four decks, 
each of which could house at least six people. So you're talking about sending 24 people to Mars together with their basic habitation in one launch. And if we launched four of these a year, which is say about half of the rate we're currently launching shuttles, okay, that would be then 100 people a year going to Mars, more or less. And if you simply looked at that immigration rate, and you made certain fairly standard sorts of demographic assumptions for a uh, new colony. Um, and you started this, and this uh, here, we, the, the assumption was that this program began in 2010. Uh, what you see is that uh, by 2050, 40 years into the program, you have 10,000 people living on Mars. And by 2110, um, a century into the program, you have uh, 80,000 people living on Mars. And well, what does that mean? Well, if one was to compare that to the population growth that actually occurred in colonial America in the uh, 17th century, uh, these are the comparison of the graphs. Uh, it actually is a somewhat slower rate of population increase than colonial America by about a factor of four which is to say it's a faster rate of population increase than occurred in Canada. Uh, and in other words, it's a little bit slower than we had in, in, in what is now the United States. Uh, but it's basically getting to the same place uh, over a comparable span of time. So that what I'm saying to you is that from the point of view of transportation alone, the difficulties associated with settling Mars are not such that colonizing Mars at a comparable rate to that which North America was colonized would hardly stretch uh, in any way the resources of the U.S. alone right now, let alone uh, several com uh, company, uh, countries uh, cooperating in such an endeavor. So it's not transportation. Transportation, and, and this is why ultimately you're better off going to North America and to Greenland. Because it's not the time of the ship that matters. It's what's available to support people once you get there. That's what matters. Um, okay. Now, if we talk about Mars, okay, so, so essentially the, the issue of colonizing Mars is to make human beings self-sustainable on Mars. Now there's lots of things we know how to do on Mars already, and these techniques can be perfected at a Mars base including various types of industrial chemistry uh, for making fuels, plastics, metals, and so on, silicons. Uh, and the resources to do them are uniquely all available on Mars, both the metals as well as the organics. Uh, and this is not really the case on the moon. The, in addition, on Mars, um, Current data supports the belief that there's probably geothermal power available on Mars in significant quantities. Mars is not geologically dead. Um, and uh, the, this, of course, is not the case with the moon, uh, which is quite dead geologically. Um, geothermal power, you should understand, is the number four source of power on Earth after combustion, hydroelectric, and nuclear. Humanity gets vastly more power from geothermal energy today than they do from wind or solar. Okay. Uh, Iceland gets virtually all of its power from geothermal sources. So this is a single geothermal well, uh, typically on Earth, produces around 10 megawatts of power. Now that's small compared to a modern urban power plant that might produce 500 to 1,000 megawatts of power. But it's much, it's, it, it, it's three orders of magnitude larger than a 10 kilowatt windmill. Uh, or solar installation. This sorts of power is available on Mars. So that these sorts of resources are available to support the growth of human civilization on Mars. But now, if indeed you had a situation like that where humans could support themselves on Mars, and you had a significant human population on Mars, the question would arise, what about transforming Mars itself into a more livable habitat? Because Mars was once a warm and wet planet. We 
We know that because of the water erosion features that are invisible all over the Martian surface. And most of that water is still there on Mars. Okay, it's currently believed that if we smooth Mars over and we melted the water out of the soil, out of the permafrost okay, and the ice, there'd be enough liquid water on Mars to cover the whole planet with an ocean 600 feet deep. Okay, now that's dry compared to the Earth. Okay, the, the, the Earth, if we were smoothed over, we'd be under 6,000 feet of water. Okay, because the Earth is basically a water world. But if you got rid of the salt water oceans of the Earth, and just look at the fresh water reserves on the continents, Mars and the Earth have about the same amount of water per acre. Okay. Uh, this is radically wetter, for instance, than the moon. Uh, and, of course, as I mentioned earlier, the organics are all there and so forth and so on. And there's CO2 on Mars. It's only in the atmosphere itself enough to give the Martian atmosphere about 1% of the thickness of Earth's, which is so thin that you need a pressure suit on Mars, just as you would in, in space. But there are vast amounts of reserves of CO2 absorbed into the soil. See, CO2 has a quality that if you have a medium with a lot of surface area, like uh, zeolite or uh, activated carbon like you might use in a fish tank filter, okay, and if you take that and you bring it down to temperatures of, well, such as typically pertain on Mars right now, minus 40 centigrade, it soaks in CO2 like a sponge. It absorbs it. In fact, activated carbon will absorb up to 40% of its weight in CO2 under those conditions. Um, that, that's how severe this is. And so it is believed that there are, in fact, vast reserves of CO2 absorbed into the Martian soil. They went there when Mars started to get cold. And, uh, but they're still there. And in fact, Every year, uh, you know, Mars is in a slightly elliptical orbit, so that it has a part of its orbit where it's closer to the sun and it gets warmer. Okay, when it does that, the planet warms a little bit. Mars's atmosphere thickens by 25 percent compared to what it is at the cold end of its orbit. That's a wild variation in atmospheric pressure. And it's caused by this adsorption and, and, and desorption from the soil due to the temperature swing. Now, and also some vaporization of dry ice from the pole. Okay. Now here's the concept that I'd like to try to get everybody to master. Okay. Which is, if you understand this, you understand the essence of the nature of Mars and the, the key fundamental uh, problem and dynamics associated with terraforming the planet. Okay. CO2 is a greenhouse gas. The thicker the CO2 atmosphere, the warmer the planet is. Okay. So if we draw a graph like this, okay, now the, 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 these curves here don't have numbers attached to them. Not, this is just notional curves. Okay. But if we say here's the pressure, and this straight line here is the temperature of the average temperature of the planet. We say as the pressure goes up, the temperature goes up. All right, we all understand that. Everybody's been hearing about the greenhouse effect on Earth. And the thicker the CO2 atmosphere on Mars, we expect there to be a greenhouse effect on the planet to get warmer. Fine. But also, because of this desorption of CO2 from the soil and evaporation from the cat, okay, the warmer the planet gets, in other words, let's look at, at, at uh, pressure now as a function of temperature. The warmer the planet gets, the thicker the atmosphere gets. So think about this as the axis of the variable, and this is the resulting pressure on the planet as a function of the temperature. And it also goes up. In other words, as temperature goes up, pressure goes up, if you get what I'm saying. So, the temperature is a function of the pressure. It increases with pressure, and the pressure increases with the temperature. Well, how do you figure out what the temperature and pressure is going to be? Well, you draw these two curves. You have to actually be able to generate these curves with accurate numbers. We'll get to how you do that in a minute. But then they cross at two points. 
Those two points are equilibrium. Those two points are the only points that the planet could be at. Because otherwise the pressure is too high for the temperature or vice versa. Okay. Now, it turns out though uh, that, well, how can I put it? If the temperature line is above the pressure line, okay, then what's that saying? Well, gee, the pressure is here, but that should say the temperature is here, and it, okay, in other words, if the pressure is here, that says the temperature should be here, but if the temperature is here, that says the pressure should be here, which says the temperature should be here, which says the pressure, and it drives you to this point, okay? Similarly, if you're in this region, what you find is that you're driven to this point. So if you're at this point, you're in a stable equilibrium because if you're trying to wander away from it, you're driven right back to it. Whereas this point here is an unstable equilibrium because if you go into either of these two regions, you'll start being driven away from it. Okay? So that's the nature of the situation. Now, what's the nature of the natural numbers? to maybe fill the atmosphere up to maybe 60 millibar, 
Okay, right now the atmosphere has a, uh, a pressure of about 8 millibar. You can vaporize the poles, you'll increase the pressure to around 60. Okay, uh, well that would be significant, but that's still not enough pressure for people not to wear spacesuits. Um, although it would greatly increase the cosmic ray and radiation shield at the surface and help you with your parachutes and airplanes and all sorts of things like that. And a lot of plants and things could live on the surface under those conditions. Um, I can't now. Um, but once you outgas that CO2 from the poles, then that would raise the temperature and the CO2 would start outgassing from the soil and by following the same sort of analysis, what one finds is that you end up with a couple of hundred millibar of CO2 in the atmosphere, and perhaps as much as 300, depending upon various assumptions. And the uh, uh, temperature, the average temperature of the tropical summer would be uh, approaching the freezing point of water, 200. 65 Kelvin is like minus 5 centigrade. Uh, that's an average day-night temperature. So in the daytime, you actually do have temperatures considerably above that. And I mean, in other words, for instance, Alaska has average temperatures uh, on that water, and it supports an abundant biosphere. Okay. Uh, you know, not just lichens, but conifers and timber wolves. Uh, so the point here, okay, to, 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 to summarize, okay, in, in my book I give equations and references for even more technical presentations and show how these kinds of numbers are calculated. Uh, but basically what you have in Mars is a positive feedback system. The warmer the planet gets, the more CO2 is put in the atmosphere. The more CO2 is put in the atmosphere, the warmer the planet gets. So that if one was set up on Mars with the intent of producing a greenhouse effect, your own efforts, in other words, in this case, you only did an effort of raising the poles by 3, 4, 5 degrees centigrade, we're raising the whole planet 40, 50, 60 degrees centigrade as a result of the catastrophic uh, runaway greenhouse effect that could be induced in such an environment. The, um, so then the question becomes how does one induce a, um, such a runaway greenhouse effect on Mars? Okay. Uh, well, in this example here, we started with the pole. Why not, instead of messing around with CFCs, why don't we just direct energy at the pole? Uh, here's a concept somebody drew once, where they've got a solar power satellite in orbit around Mars, and it's shooting microwaves down at the planet, and it's vaporizing the CO2 at the pole, and then that CO2 adds to the greenhouse effect and sets the rest of it off. Now, there's some validity in this idea, but in fact, it's all wrong. Uh, the, uh, you wouldn't want to use a solar power satellite because you're directing crude energy down to the surface. There's really no purpose to convert it to electricity at 10% efficiency and then beam it at 50% efficiency. In other words, you're only getting 5% of the energy that is incident on those panels, and they're much bigger and heavier and more complex than they need to be. Really, all you would have to do is put a mirror in orbit around Mars. Because a mirror can be something as lightweight as a solar sail and, um, and therefore can really be made very large, much easily than a, a, a solar power satellite. Uh, and it converts 100% of the light that it produces, that, that it encounters, into light into the on surface. Now, what you want to do there's a concept that was invented by Robert Ford called the statite. Because you need to keep this mirror focused on one place on the planet. And it turns out what you can do if you have a, a, a solar sail out here orbiting the planet but at a considerable distance, so the planet's gravity is attracting it but only very weakly, you can use the sunlight pressure to balance the gravity of the planet and just hold it motionless and focus the light in on the pole. And it turns out that if you did that, 
um, if you um, just uh, made a solar sail with uh, luminized mylar with fairly near-term materials, um, if you wanted to heat the polar cap by 5 centigrade or kelvins, you'd require a solar sail that raised weighed 200,000 tons. Now, 200,000 tons is an awful big spacecraft. I laugh at NASA whenever they start talking about spacecrafts that weigh 1,000 tons, okay? But if we kind of shift gears mentally here and put ourselves in the future, 200,000 tons, there are many ships sailing on the Earth's ocean today that weigh more than 200,000 tons, okay? They're quite common, okay? So if we're talking about transforming a planet, an enterprise to create, to produce in space and launch a solar sail that weighs about as much as uh, a medium large tanker um, uh, on the ships today, it would certainly be worthwhile as a climate transforming exercise. So you could do this, okay? And you could warm those poles, and you could vaporize the CO2 in the poles, and that itself will um, increase the planet's atmosphere by an order of magnitude, drive up temperatures by maybe 20 degrees, and perhaps start a runaway greenhouse effect. <coughs> now, if we wanted to <coughs> go beyond that, there's two things you could do at that point. Okay. Uh, one thing that's been suggested um, is, um, well, it, to actually introduce greenhouse gases. Now, there's um, more or less two kinds of greenhouse gases one could discuss other than the CO2 itself. CO2 is a good greenhouse gas, but there are things that are much better. Methane and ammonium are greenhouse gases a couple of orders of magnitude more potent than CO2. And the thing that's interesting about methane and ammonia is that they are gases that can be produced naturally by bacteria of the appropriate types. Okay. And um, so that if we did this mirror business, which would warm the planet significantly, thicken the atmosphere, create a situation where liquid water could exist at least transiently in the tropical regions, uh, then perhaps we could release bacteria on Mars capable of uh, multiplying themselves uh, and uh, introducing methane or ammonia or both into the atmosphere uh, and actually commence uh, biogenic uh, uh, terraforming. Um, th that might indeed be possible uh, and it would be certainly something we'd want to do for whatever it was worth because it would be a very cheap thing to do uh, as well. Now it has been suggested that what somebody could do as well is um, uh, this, this chart, by the way, was made by my stepson in a um, younger life, somewhat more charming 12 year old than his current teenage incarnation. But uh, in the uh, outer solar system, um, um, uh, there are uh, probably objects made of frozen ammonia that could be propelled to Mars using nuclear thermal rocket engines to take the material turn into gas and propel these things. And in fact, at the sacrifice of perhaps 10% of its material, send it on a trajectory that intersects Saturn or something, and that would give it a gravity assist to send it to uh, Mars. Uh, and um, this uh, could work. Um, Except that when it hits Mars, uh, it will hit a typical asteroid, asteroid, whatever you would call it, might hit with Mars with an energy equivalent of perhaps 100,000 megatons uh, of high explosive. And uh, therefore, I don't really think it's going to be done. Not because it's technically infeasible, but because the people who are going to be paying for terraforming Mars are the Martians, okay? And so they're not going to want to do it this way. This is a significant range safety problem. Um, so therefore, uh, aside from what the bacteria can do, the other thing that one can do to move things along is to 
uh, introduced the artificial greenhouse gases, so-called CFCs. Now, CFCs are tremendous greenhouse gases. Orders and orders of magnitude more powerful than CO2, several orders of magnitude more powerful than ammonia or, or methane. Uh, so they're pretty good. However, there's two kinds of CFCs. There's chlorinated fluorocarbons, which have chlorine in them, and fluorocarbons, which don't have chlorine in them. And the advantage of using the fluorocarbons, such as CF4 with perfluoromethane, for example, is that they do not destroy ozone. Okay? And if we're going to terraform Mars, we'd like the planet to get a nice ozone layer to keep UV off the surface. And so you want to use fluorocarbons uh, rather than CFCs as such. I throw around the term CFC a lot because that's you know, the one everyone is, is familiar with. But really, I'm talking about a subset of the CFCs, the uh, fluorocarbons. Well, they're very potent. If you, uh, right now, we are producing around, uh, on Earth, around 1,000 a, a tons an hour of CFCs. And if you did that, okay, on Mars, okay, you would uh, increase the planet's temperature just through your own delta T, your own input to the system by 10 degrees centigrade. And then that would be greatly multiplied. That would create a runaway greenhouse effect on the planet, without doubt. And uh, the net result would be increase the temperature of the planet on the order of 50 or 60 centigrade. Uh, now, well, what kind of effort is required to do that? Well, we can discuss it in terms of power. It would take around 5,000 megawatts of power um, to um, do that, which is roughly double the power that Houston uses. Okay? It's less power than New York City uses. That's the kind of power you're talking about. That's the scale of industrial activity you're talking about. Okay? So it's not small, but it's only a tiny fraction of the amount of power that the human race currently wields. Okay? If we compare it to the general level of human activity, okay, this is roughly the amount of power that Holland wields. Okay? Uh, so that a uh, substantial human civilization, or, or you know, moderately substantial uh, Holland size, um, is something that wields this kind of power. Uh, that's the scale of effort that is required uh, to produce a runaway greenhouse on Mars. Now, if you did that, well, how fast would this runaway greenhouse occur? That's of interest. Speed. The CO2 is absorbed in the soil. And the stuff near the surface comes out first, because it's the one that sees the temperature rise. Okay. The, uh, so what you get is how fast does a temperature pulse penetrate into the ground on Mars? Well, this we can calculate fairly accurately by assuming that Martian dirt is not that different than terrestrial dirt. Uh, and this is what you get. Uh, that after okay, one year, the temperature pulse penetrates about four meters and you get a, a 20 millibar atmosphere. Remember, Mars today has got about seven. Okay, so that's inside of just one year, you're tripling the atmosphere. Okay, in nine years, you're up to 60 millibar. You're in order of magnitude larger. Okay, in 25 years, you're on the order of 100 millibar. In 100 years, you're like 200. Okay. Now, what's 200 millibar? 200 millibar is a fifth of the Earth atmosphere. It's 3 psi. 3 psi is how much oxygen you are breathing right now. Because oxygen is only 20% of the air. Okay. You, there's a partial pressure of 200 millibar of oxygen in this room. Okay. If we pump this room down, and left in 200 millibar of oxygen, everybody here can breathe just fine. Okay. Uh, on uh, Apollo missions, um, they were at um, like 3.8 psi pure oxygen, um, about uh, 250 millibar or so, um, is what they were. Uh, so, uh, in other words, if you had an atmosphere like that, 
humans would not need to wear spacesuits anymore. They only need a breathing mask because they couldn't breathe the atmosphere. It would be all CO2. But the amount of pressure that it has is enough that someone breathing from an oxygen mask would be able to uh, cope uh, quite well. Uh, and furthermore, you could create domed cities. You know the big domed cities of science fiction, several miles in diameter? Well, those wouldn't work on the moon or Mars today because the vacuum on the moon or near vacuum on Mars would be such that there's a large pressure difference between the interior of the dome and the exterior of the dome, and they blow themselves apart. But if you had a situation where there was an exterior atmosphere with adequate pressure, so the pressure on the inside of the dome would be the same or, or just slightly more than the pressure on the outside, so it would hold itself up. It would be like the domes and the tennis courts, which are inflatable, but essentially negligible pressure difference between the interior and the exterior. Okay. The, uh, so you could, in fact, create your huge dome cities of um, science fiction uh, fame. So under those conditions, now once again, you see that this is something that can be produced within 100 years of the commencement of the terraforming program. A radical change in Mars. Humans not needing spacesuits. Plants to be able to grow in the open just fine because you have a temperate climate, you have lots of pressure, you have liquid water, you have rain. Okay, you could create an aquatic habitat straight away because they would be aerated by aquatic plants. You could actually have fish. You could go fishing on Mars. Uh, the, uh, but and at the plants could spread across the planet, and as they did, they would start to introduce oxygen into the atmosphere. Now, there's other things you can do. You can try to directly produce oxygen artificially through the industrial means. But it turns out that if you uh, compare uh, covering the planet with plants, assuming 1% efficient plants, uh, there are plants that exist today that are 1% efficient. Okay. Biospheres are not 1% efficient because they're allowed to decay again after they grow. Okay. But plants are, and so if you harvested the plants, if you turn the wood into furniture, you're not supposed to have any material to get it. Okay. Uh, they actually considerably outclass what you could reasonably do with all sorts of uh, industrial or, or orbital capabilities. Uh, and if we make that assumption, what we find is that uh, it would take um, about 900 years to put enough oxygen in the atmosphere for people to breathe it without augmentation of any kind. However, that said, we're talking 100 years from now, we're talking 200 years from now. As this program proceeds, human technological capabilities will advance. And I believe that, you know, by 100 years from now, when people are into this terraforming program, and they go and they read my book or look up the charts of this talk, they'll basically have an attitude towards it somewhat similar to that perhaps we might have towards the Jules Verne's design of uh, the lunar mission, okay, which is, Wow, he was prescient. He realized people would go to the moon. But doing it with artillery, how 19th century can you get? Okay, similarly, you know, they might say, well, he was on the ball. He knew he would terraform Mars. But doing it with plants and uh, the fluorocarbon factories, how 20th century can you get? Of course, we're going to do it with microscopic self replicating nano robots. Okay, the, uh, you know, in other words, means that. What I just showed you today is, is not really a design of a terraforming program, but an existence proof. To show that it can be done with means that are comprehensible with some modest extensions of current engineering. I think that when people actually get around to doing it, they will do it with means considerably more elegant. They may start doing it with means that are within the scope of, of, of this talk. But as this program develops, it will be done by a society whose uh, means are increasingly uh, more distant from those that the current view is realistic. Okay, but what I've just shown you is if we can do it with artillery, okay, if we can do it with Jules Verne's techniques, then they'll certainly be able to do it with true 21st century techniques. So this is the goal. Blue 
multiple cars. Okay, it can be done. Okay, uh, there are some people who, conceding all that I have said today, raise some objections. They say, "What right do we have to bring Mars to life? Life? Who are we? Are we playing God?" Okay, I I don't have any sympathy with this position at all. Okay, <laughs> if people are to argue that the current Mars is better than a living Mars then they should also be willing to argue that returning Earth to its original dead state would be better than the living Earth that we have today. Yep. Okay. So just as the living Earth that we have today is a more noble thing and a more valuable and wonderful thing than the dead Earth of its distant past, so I believe that a living Mars is a much more wonderful and valuable thing than its current state. And I see nothing unnatural about creatures of nature ourselves going and making Mars a living world any more than it was unnatural for our ancestors to make Earth a living world. And I say we should do it. And I say the following, that not only should we do it, but that this will perhaps be the most noble act that human beings have ever done, creating a living world where there was none before. And I think that as human beings proceed from Mars to move out to the solar system and colonize interstellar space, they will look back on this as the most epic achievement of original solar system humanity, and it will be a source of pride to humanity ever after. No one will be able to look at this and not be proud of it to be human. Thank you. Thanks for your attention. 